Welcome everyone to another week with Dr. McDougall, live with Dr. McDougall. I am Gustavo Tolosa in Dallas and Dr. McDougall, of course, is in Santa Rosa, California. And um, we are going to have some question and answers today. Thank you all for logging in. We can see you logging in from everywhere. And uh, the Hawaii trip is coming up soon. And I'm super excited. I was just showing Dr. McDougall my swimming trunks here, <laughs> ready to go. And uh, so, Dr. McDougall, are you ready to board that plane? How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, we've got uh, the three grandsons, older grandsons <laughs> coming along. So we got our boogie boards all set. And um, let's see, Mary does a large amount of the packing except for my own. I do my own packing. And uh, the reason is, is because then I at least know I have underwear. So, you know, that's that's kind of the way it is. And but she's she gets the bulk of the stuff ready. She's got the boogie boards out and yeah, we're ready to go. We got 150 people that are gonna show up on Saturday for probably I know the best food we've ever had, but maybe the best trip too. Uh, I'm gonna try and go out on the sailboats at least twice, see the whales. That's a very nice thing. You know, we used to we used to own a couple of uh, ocean going sailboats and uh <clears throat> Anytime I have a chance to get out on the water, I love it. It's really good. So, yeah, we're leaving uh, within a matter of hours, aren't we? That's right. Well, I leave Saturday very early in the morning. I don't I Maybe you leave tomorrow, Friday, right? I do. I do leave tomorrow. We're going to get there a day ahead of time. And then, right. uh, so, so we'll be there eight days instead of seven. Uh, good, uh, good. Well, it's, it's going to be fun. Who, who knows if we're going to do Kauai again, <clears throat> but uh, we don't even have anything planned. Uh, it's, it's amazing how little we have planned. We've got the advanced study weekend, which is really getting full. And you're going to that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I warned all of you that our speakers are outstanding. <clears throat> and, and you really don't want to miss this weekend if you can't see it live. Uh, by default, it wasn't my plan, but by default, because of, uh, of all the technical issues we have, I'm going to be broadcasting it almost live. So it goes up maybe 15 minutes after the speakers. So if you want to sign up on the internet, uh, go ahead. I was not going to broadcast it almost live this time. However, it turns out that uh, the men in black, all of the, the gentlemen that do the technical work, uh, they have uh, told me that it's just too hard to change. So we're doing it live. So sign up. Yeah, it'll be good. And to Miss Kevin Hall, <clears throat> I just have to tell you, Kevin Hall works for the NIH, and as I told you, it took me six months to get him here, and I'm still filling out paperwork, which I got today, which allows me to take a, a, an unbiased NIH researcher and have him come and talk to a program such as ours. So it wasn't easy, and understandably so. You don't want uh, you don't want the NIH people or any government officials to be swayed by industry or money. So to have him come. Uh, <clears throat> requires a certain amount of ethical rules, but you don't want to miss him because he uh, started out as a friend of the low carb movement. I, I would just guess that, I'll let him tell a story. But he did take money from Gary Taubes, who is the sugar guy, the overweight uh, writer, science writer, who's written so many books condemning sugar a la potatoes too. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, he, uh, Gary Taubes funded this study, which we're going to be talking a lot about this weekend, about the uh, metabolic advantage of low-carb diets. In other words, the low-carb people tell you that there's something special about eating meat and dairy and eggs and avoiding uh, bread and pasta and so on. And that special thing is that the body gets into a very efficient metabolic state where it burns fat better on a low-carb, high-meat diet than it does on a high-carb, low-meat diet. Well, that was the tested hypothesis. And I sent you all a, uh, a letter about this last week via the email. I sent you a picture of Kevin Hall. I spent, sent you links to two of his major research papers, one paid for by Gary Taubes, trying to show that there's a metabolic advantage to low-carb diets. So I sent you that paper, which is in cell metabolism. You can get it for free. And he also ev evaluated the biggest losers which is that television show where people would lose, I don't know. <clears throat> I never watched it, but let's just guess they lost a lot of weight as to whether or not these people were as efficient as losing it the second time or whether or not 
they regained the weight or all kinds of things that were the ultimate out outcomes of the big loser. So he published that study also, which I linked to the email I sent you a couple of days ago. And I linked a um, grand rounds that he did at New York University, uh, grand rounds uh, to other doctors where he talked about the results of the study comparing low carb, a la Atkins, uh, Gary Taubes, anyway, David Perlmeyer, uh, Williams, and uh, just, just a whole bunch of low carb people, uh, Sally Farrell, a whole bunch of, you know, all the low carbers. Anyway, uh, he looked at those diets to look for this metabolic advantage. And you'll listen to his paper or his presentation at New York University, and you'll hear him live. As a matter of fact, uh, my son, Craig, you know, the doctor, actually asked me to rearrange the schedule so that he could watch in person Kevin Hall talk about these low-carb diets. And so I did. I changed the schedule so that he could be there. But, uh, you, you know, I wouldn't be smiling if I couldn't tell you the results were the exact opposite of what the low-carbers predicted. And uh, Kevin and Hall and I have been in some contact uh, all along the way. And, <clears throat> you know, I asked him uh, how much attention did Gary Taub's new book, which hit the New York Times bestselling list last week. Don't, I'm not telling you to buy it, believe me. I didn't read it myself. But I just asked him how much this new national bestselling book of uh, how bad high carb diets are, how much attention was given to the study the NIH did, which was paid for by the author of the new book, Gary Taubes. How much did he talk about the study? And I don't know, I haven't read it, but any of you who take the trouble to read it, you tell me how prominently Kevin Hall and the NIH are presented in the new national best-selling book. I bet not at all. And I'll tell you why not at all, because it tells you the opposite of what they're trying to promote. Anyway, we got the advanced study weekend coming up. We have David Katz. We have uh, Wayne Dysinger. Oh, Wayne has been my friend for 35 years. He's at Loma Linda University. He's a professor that tries to teach medical students about good nutrition. He'll be there. Mary's going to give her presentations, which she hasn't done in a formal high-tech situation yet. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this weekend. So anyway, we've got the advanced study weekend coming after Hawaii. You ask me how in the world can I keep everything straight, Gustavo, and the problem is, is I can't. <laughs> that's uh, right. It's a lot going on. A lot going on. I have a lot of, a lot of people to help, and uh, all I have to do is just kind of get on stage and do my song and dance and that's right. you know, answer a few questions, defend the people against a few liars, <clears throat> which is what I find myself doing. The next newsletter, actually, I'm working on now, talks about diabetic drugs, which have adverse cardiovascular effects. Uh, there were six major studies that I published for you. I believe it was in my December 2009 newsletter, but somewhere in 2009. And these six studies show that, uh, that treating diabetics with medication, we're talking about type 2 diabetics, we're talking about diabetic pills, insulin, metformin, sulfonylureas, but treating them aggressively and checking their sugar a lot. These six studies, these are the, well, there was one which suggested that it may be of help. And that was the United Kingdom study. But otherwise, these studies showed adverse effects from treating diabetics aggressively with diabetic pills and insulin. So that was uh, finished in 2008. The last three studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the FDA came out in concurrence with these studies which showed no benefit in terms of cardiovascular death. That means strokes, heart attacks, dying of heart disease. And actually, the ACCORD study showed a dramatic increased risk in dying and dying of heart disease. So the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute stopped at 17 months early. So you got all these studies showing no benefit from treating with diabetic drugs, especially treating diet, type 2 diabetics aggressively. So the FDA came out then and they, and they said, look, the only criterion we use to approve diabetic pills is if they reduce the blood sugars and don't obviously kill people overnight. I mean, they didn't say that, but that's the, the thing. That they had no requirements for improved overall general health or reduction in cardiovascular risk of dying. That was 2008. The FDA said that. In compliance, the drug industries, uh, they started funding multiple studies to show that their drugs reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. 
Uh, they did multiple studies to try and show that. There have been three of them published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I'll be talking about these three in the next newsletter and also the talk I give, uh, which will be at the Advanced Study Weekend. And the only three studies that have been published show, so far either show a non-significant uh, harm or benefit. I mean, there's either nothing in terms of stroke, heart attacks, or overall cardiovascular death, or at best, I'm talking about whatever parameters they use, at best, the drugs offer less than a 3%. That's like 3.0% advantage over placebo. So, I mean, these, these drug companies, they're, they're uh, making false claims uh, to doctors. You know, they go in the cute little drug reps with their pizza and their donuts. No, no gender offense intended, ladies and gentlemen, but I used to work in the medical office. And uh, they'll go in and they'll sell the doctors, look, our drugs show a 34% reduction in risk of dying of this and that. Excuse me, those are relative risks. Those are numbers that are manipulated and uh, any good doctor should know about that kind of a line. And uh, if the doctor would have asked uh, this person, this drug sales per person, what's the absolute benefit to my patients? I'm talking about spending uh, $300 or more a year on drugs. I'm talking about checking the blood sugars many times a day. Uh, what is the absolute advantage to the patient is less than 3%. In other words, virtually nothing with significant adverse effects, including eye damage. Well, that's going to be coming out. I'm also going to be talking about using insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring, which is another big topic these days. And uh, likely, I'll just mention a little bit now, but I'll, I'll talk more about it later. I get patients coming into my practice and they've got these uh, monitors, these things stuck in their body, which continuously check the blood sugar like every five minutes. And they have to uh, counter test these, uh, these uh, automatic machines by doing self sticks two or three or four times a day to make sure they're properly calibrated. So you still have to do the sticks but what I see, which I'm going to be writing about, well, first of all, there was hardly any advantage to using these continuous glucose monitors as opposed to regular testing and treating for uh, diabetics. Hardly any difference, 1.4% difference in hemoglobin A1C levels. So uh, they hardly showed any difference. But what I see, and I, I know this is probably way uh, distant for most of you, but I must see one person a month at uh, my clinic that has one of these continuous monitoring devices and uh, combined with a pump usually, so they pump them with insulin. And I'll tell you, these, these people's lives are destroyed by this technology. All they, all they do is they sit around, you know, every five minutes or so and they check their sugar and they look at their maid, they go, oh, my sugar's 210. How much should I take? And then they get out there, their, their apparatus to give themselves some insulin. They shoot themselves with the insulin. And a few minutes later, they look at the monitor. And I say to them, where's your life? You know, who is this person next to you? It's a glucose continuous monitor. They, they used to be known as your husband or your wife, the person you talk to. And so these li people's lives are horribly destroyed. So one of the first things I do is encourage them to stop this continuous glucose monitoring. But that'll be in the next newsletter, too. And I'll be talking about hemoglobin A1C. Oh, and I'm going to do a big thing on uh, on glucophage, metformin, which is a it's a drug of choice. But the only reason it's the drug of choice is because it does the least harm. No good, but the least harm concerning diabetic pills. And so, what's happened over? Well, I've, I'm talking to you about six two, since 2008 and 2009 when I wrote you. What's happened over the last? Um, eight or nine years, is the drug companies have just gotten bigger in studying thousands more people showing little or no benefit, great harm, huge costs, $333 billion a year spent in the U.S. on diabetic care, and they're still getting away with it. Yes, we will make America great again. And one way we're gonna do it is we're gonna, we're gonna tell the public the truth. You know, what you're getting with these fancy new drugs is a lot of harm, a lot of cost. And I'm really, I'm exaggerating to say a 3% advantage. I'm giving them the, the best of the doubt. Anyway, that's what I'm working on. So Gustavo, probably I'm not going to have any time to go swimming. 
or snorkeling or boogie boarding or yes i will or taking the tubes to the grandkids down but i do have to finish this uh, newsletter article which will come out sometime in the month yes yes you do and i want to i want to remind everybody to please sign up for your free newsletter because a lot of the questions that people are having or you usually have their their answer in your newsletter so they go to your website right and that's where they sign up for your newsletter they do and i wanted to you know i've written this newsletter since 1986 of course, it obviously didn't come out by email then. So 1986, so that's more than 30 years. And there have been times when I've said to my uh, my co-producer, Neil, uh, there are times I've said to him, look, Neil, you know, I spent a one or two weeks at this every month. I don't know whether I continue to do this. And then as I'm writing the newsletter, I say to myself, and especially as I get done, wow how much have i learned i mean myself personally learned there's an article that came out today on the falsity of using hemogo and a1c's that just came out this morning i think it was the new england journal of medicine i didn't have a chance to write it read it but about about how people are being duped into chasing around these hemoglobin a1c numbers this was published today and then last week there were uh, three articles published in the new england journal of medicine on these uh um, continuous monitorings of blood sugar and the lack of benefits and of course you know and then there were the uh the three studies that i'm going to talk about that i just uh discussed which were published in 2013 2015 2016 about the new drugs supposedly not only lowering blood sugar but improving the quality of your life which they don't i mean clearly they don't and reducing your risk of dying of heart disease and strokes and just dying overall. At best, I'll give them a 3% advantage. And they paid for all the studies. You know, mm -hmm. tens of millions of dollars they invested in trying to show something they weren't able to show to any reasonable patient. I mean, if you were paying for the drugs, by the way, it costs about $27,000 a year to take care of a diabetic patient. If they were paying for the drugs themselves, and some doctor or dietitian or drug company salesperson looked them in the eyes and said, and at best, you're going to get a 3% reduction in anything. The patient look, I'm not going to do that. And how much benefit can I get as a type 2 diabetic if I change my diet? Oh, by the way, with a change of your diet and associated weight loss, type 2 diabetes is 100% curable. And it costs you nothing. Cut your food bill by 40 to 80%. And makes anyway you know me i could go on forever so that's what the next <laughs> well since you're on the topic and since we have some new people here dr yeah. mcdougall give us the two minute uh you know overview of the you now the the um starch oh, solution just just because why we all know uh, a little secret i guess not a secret but it's, it's keeping it simple but could you just say a few words because i know there's always new people yeah, and it's they're always behind new. everybody and, and the, the, the things that i want you to remember even those of you who knew who know it well first of all is the truth is simple and easy to understand so i can explain to you the program that i recommend in two sentences the mcdougall diet is based on starch it's really crucial i could go on for a, a half an hour about starch that means rice corn potatoes sweet potatoes so the mcdougall program is based on starch that's what you eat most of like 80 90 percent of your diet with the addition of non-starchy vegetables would be like kale and cauliflower and broccoli and so on and a couple of fruits and then that's the first sentence the mcdougall diet is based on starches vegetables and fruits boom you know exactly what you're supposed to eat and then the second sentence is the McDougall diet does not contain animal foods. Oh, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about little snails and snakes and the big cows and giraffes. I can't eat those anymore, uh, even fishes. And uh, no free oils, no vegetable oil. That means corn oil, safflower oil, flaxseed oil. These things are toxic. So that's what the diet is. I've been doing this for <clears throat> 40 years. Uh, we published results, which, by the way, I'm, I've asked uh, Kevin Hall to read. And we published results. Uh, I've asked him to read it before he arrives on the 11th. Because I'd, I'd really like to get uh, the NIH involved in what we're doing. And I'm going to try really hard. 
Uh, I've made lots of friends around the world uh, with my weekends and with the broadcasts that you and I are doing, Gustavo, and the ones Rob and I do together, and, you know, the newsletters and so on. We've made lots of friends. If I can make friends with the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and we do have a little bucket of money there. It's called the Research and Education Foundation, which, by the way, you're welcome to send more to. And if I get the NIH to study our work, I'm sure you're going to, you know, uh, <clears throat> dig deep under the mattress and send it to our foundation. If I get the NIH to study our work, that could be a big deal, couldn't it? Well, I'm going to try. Anyway, I, I presented to Kevin Hall, as I presented all, to all of you, two of our scientific papers that have been recently published. One is on 1,615 people showing the weight loss, the cholesterol reduction, uh, blood pressure reduction, showing that nearly 90% reduce or stop their medications, all in seven days. And the other report that I asked him to read, which I asked all you to read, is the one that was done by Oregon Health and Science University, which is a one-year study on the effects of our diet. Phenomenal results. You know, not everything I would have wanted, the phenomenal results, certainly enough to get the attention of the NIH or any other research or organization, especially if we can get them started with a little seed money. So there is a method in my madness. Don't tell Kevin Hall. I'm only, you know, tell him I'm only having him here because I hardly wait for him to speak. But I'm also planning on making him a friend, just like I have David Katz, who will be here on Friday night to talk. And Wayne Dysinger has been my friend for over 35 years. In fact, he's the only doctor that testified with me to try and get a law passed in we did get a law passed in California that makes doctors learn about human nutrition. Wayne was right there by my side in the legislature uh, giving testimony. So anyway, we've made friends along the way. That's right. That's right. I, I, I also I want to keep work, uh, letting people know about their newsletter because the people send us hundreds, if not thousands of questions for you, Dr. Yeah. Marcugo, but so many of those questions are already answered in your newsletters. I really want to encourage them to go uh, uh, look at the newsletter so they don't get frustrated when we don't get their answer, their questions here. Someone is mentioning an article that and unfortunately I haven't heard, and I think it would be uh, Interesting to have you comment, Dr. McDougall. He says, uh, could you sometime please share uh, with your webinar viewers the information from your Naked Food Magazine article, Winter of 2017, The Real Fountain of Youth. I think they would love it. What a great article. Can you just comment about a little bit about that article? Uh, na naked Food is uh, the, the love and dedication of one woman. Uh, it, it's hard to believe, and it's sold all over the country, but uh, she's uh, put all the effort into it. And every once in a while, she asks if she can uh, translate one of my newsletter articles. And the one you mentioned is the January 2006 newsletter article about aging, about living to 100 gracefully. And uh, there I talked about uh, <clears throat> uh, various long-lived centenarians, people who live over 100, and uh, you know, that's of, of, of great interest to folks as you get older, is uh, trying to live a little longer, but gracefully, you know, feeling good. So I, I could talk about that, but if you want to just go read the article I wrote, uh, it's the January 2006 newsletter. And you just go to the website and you go to the search engine, you put in aging or uh, January 2006 newsletter, and it'll pop right up for you. It's there. <clears throat> And, and the nice thing is, is it really doesn't have to be updated. I updated some of the material on that aging because I guess Harper One really liked it. So I, uh, some of that aging material and from that article is really in this book right here. Uh, Mary just brought in some copies of uh, Naked Food. Well, you know, this is a great, great publication. And uh, I couldn't tell you how often it comes out. But uh, you will find it in, in various natural food stores called Naked Food. Uh, Margarita's picture is right here. Not that that makes any difference, but uh, oh, this is, yes. this is a soul, a pretty much a sole production of hers. All right. It's a beautiful, beautiful magazine. Yes, it but is. I'm trying to get her to come out and speak for us, but it hasn't worked out so far. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's where the article came from, my January 2006. Okay, all right. 
Talking, if you were talking about aging gracefully, Dr. McDougall, someone was asking about and a question. I thought it was interesting. We all know what uh, people die from when they eat the standard American diet, you know, right. heart attacks and, and, and cancer and many other things. So this person was saying, what would someone that is uh, entirely plant-based uh, for years, how, how can you describe what, what would we die from and, and how? Uh, because we, we all die, right? <laughs> well, that, you know, that, that's a natural question. Uh, you know, it is. Flies, I think, live five days, and tortoises live 140 years, and I don't know. Was a horse live 20 years, and a dog lives nine? So uh, each and every species uh, of animal and plant has a lifespan of, of how long that they live on average. And so that's a really important question for human beings. Well, even though I know you all want to live to be 150 and still be playing soccer and windsurfing, uh, it's not going to happen. I think the oldest person that uh, has ever lived on record was 124 years, a lady from France. Uh, my, my oldest relative was uh, old, old mom. And old mom was my great grandmother and she lived to be 106. And uh, she used to tell me, she lived right next door. She used to tell me, you know, Johnny, it really isn't worth it after 90. She was in, uh, she had a walker and she had uh, hearing aids, but she could still repair our clothes when she was 104, 105 years old. She still could handle a needle and fix some of the, the grandkids clothes and she did at times. But uh, I would come over there and she'd say, you know, Johnny, this one, she's 102, 103, 104. She'd say, Johnny, I don't know why God didn't take me last night. Uh, and I've heard many, many people discuss this. There's a, there's a length of time to live and there's a time to die. And you want the answer when it is for people. Just to tell you that the last thing that she heard was she was when she was 106 in bed, my mother came in and whispered in her ear, that Johnny just, Johnny and Mary just had a new baby and his name was Craig. That was 33 years ago. And they named him after your first husband, her only husband. Or she was only married once and then she died. But uh, it was too long. It was really, really too long for her. And I think most people I've met over say 90 will tell you something similar. You know, 90 was enough. But uh, if you look at uh, various ways of trying to see how long people are supposed to live, and you can also look at cell doubling times in the laboratory to see how quickly a human cell doubles. And it has uh, 52 doubling times, as I remember. That's your normal cells are allowed to die or double 52 times and then you die. So when does that occur? Well, in human beings, it's around 85. That's the normal lifespan. And how do you die? Well. I asked that question once of Nathan Pritikin, who you know I think a lot of, to say the least, thought a lot of. And he told me, and it seemed like that was the way that old mom died, is your heart just fails. And then what happens is fluid backs up into your lungs and then you die quietly, quietly. You die in your sleep. Now I've had that contested. We, we talked about that one night on one of our advanced study weekends when Caldwell Esselstyn was there. And somebody asked the question and Caldwell said, his answer is, well, the immune system just stops being able to defend itself and you die of uh, infections, pneumonia, et cetera. You know, that could be too. One way or another, the systems, the heart system, cardiovascular system, immune system, and so on, it's just had its day. And that, uh, you know, I would guess that's 85 years. Uh, if you get fewer, you know, that's the way the averages roll. <laughs> If you take good care of yourself, I think you're more likely to get the 85 than if you don't take good care of yourself. And then uh, some of you will be enjoying your lives uh, into your 90s. More power to you. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. Well, right, we right now, right now, Mary and I are having good at 70. Good times. <laughs> the interesting thing is, and when I get a letter sometime, I just got one for a couple of days ago from a man. He may, be, he may become a star at Google, as many people do. But the story he was telling me is that uh, he discovered us, and I think he may have discovered it through Engine 2 also. Don't remember. We get so many stories. But he discovered our work, our kind of work, either directly through us or through Esselstyn's program or Campbell's or Ornish's or somebody. And uh, he got the good news, changed his diet, 
and this was about uh, two, three years ago, and he's now 70. He lost over 100 pounds, and he's out running six miles a day and walking unbelievable miles a day. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm 70 also, but I didn't spend, you know, three quarters of my life 100 pounds overweight. And uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm probably doing as well as he is, but you know, because I eaten pepperoni pizzas and steaks until I was 70. And then I guess there's all kinds of points to be made. But I think the most important point for me to make from that story is that it's never too late. And your body, even though you've abused yourself so many, so many times in so many ways as I did, and I'm still not perfect, but I mean, I, I've, I've taken some big steps since my 20s. Even if you're 60 or 70 or 75 years old and you can't get out of the chair and you think life's over. It's not. The body is amazing. It's the ability to recover. And, you know, this man, as I say, I hope we can make him a star McDougaller. I mean, there's an example. He's my age and he's doing things that, you know, I don't do. I don't run six miles a day. Could I? I don't know that I could have ran six miles a day when I was 20 years old. <laughs> uh, I've never been a runner. Uh, but but it, it, it just it inspired me to think, that, uh, you know, actually, uh, it even surprised me to to hear his story about being 70 and all the things he could do now uh, just by changing his diet two or three years ago. Right, right. Dr. McDougall, um, would you comment uh, on a topic that it's, um, you know, it's not common, but someone was asking about the, um, can Dr. McDougall establish what the eventual negative short and long-term effects are of fluoride in the drinking water and of flushing one's mouth with fluoride to prevent cavities for one minute each day? Okay, that's a question I have to go back many years and I haven't updated recently, but I can kind of give you my thoughts on it because I've been looking at the fluoride issue for more than 40 years. I've had, I have children that are 42 years old a child. So this has been an important thing for me for many years. And when I was a little kid, we used to get fluoride treatments that actually uh, prop your mouth open and put these gauze type strips loaded with fluoride on your teeth. Uh, you, were you that old? Are you that old? Gustavo, you can remember that. Not that old. Okay. Well, that's how old I am, as that's how they used to do it. That's how you used to apply it with, uh, with applicators that they clamped onto your teeth. And uh, you know, since then, of course, that, that was considered a modern medical miracle. And uh, I don't believe in throwing the baby out with the wash water. So all of our children have gotten some amount of fluoride, but we've been very careful not to give them too much. You know, they don't get fluoride or they didn't get fluoride toothpaste. Their grandkids don't get fluoride toothpaste and fluoride vitamins and fluoride drinking water. Because the difference between effectiveness, if I remember correctly, effectiveness in terms of reducing dental caries and toxicity, where you get what we call chiclet teeth, which are white white blotches on your teeth, and you may have an increased risk of cancer and osteoporosis. Those have been discussed. The difference in toxicity is, uh, as I remember, sixfold. So it's not a lot of difference between whether you're going to get benefits or harms. Now, people have come to me uh, very concerned over many, many decades about putting fluoride in the drinking water and forcing you to take fluoride. Uh, I think that's wrong uh, from many points of view. One is, why waste all the fluoride washing your car and watering your lawn? Because that's what you're doing when you put it in the drinking water. And the reason you you know this has come about is because of the aluminum industry. Uh, one of the byproducts of aluminum mining, which is, aluminum is huge, you can imagine, is they get fluoride left over and they have to have something to do with it. So one of the motivations as to why they put it in the drinking water is what are you going to do with all that fluoride left over from aluminum mining? Uh, but I guess the bottom line, what I would tell you as parents and grandchildren, just like when those of you who have strong feelings about immunization, these are things that I've looked at in terms of benefit and risk of my children and grandchildren. And all of my offspring do get a small amount of fluoride, small. And uh, <clears throat> they also get proper immunizations, as we've discussed uh, but it ought to be, you know, be something you do fully informed and not have this stuff dumped on you in toxic levels. You don't even know, you don't even understand what's going on. Why are my teeth look like uh, chiclets and, you know, 
other adverse effects that may occur. You, you, you definitely need to be in control of this one, which is the fluoride intake in your family. Right, right. Dr. McDougall, there is a, a doctor here on, online, and she also, um, actually, I, I don't know if it's he or she because of the name, but uh, also sent a question by uh, email. Would you um, be able to answer this one? Uh, it's a little bit long, but I'll do my best to read it. Um, all of it. I have been following you since 1996 when I was introduced to your book, The McDougall Plan in Chiropractic College. My question is this. With the latest research showing the benefits of burning ketones for fuel, which mimics the physiological effects of fasting, I'm having a hard time with the back and forth question of fat in the diet. Obviously, to get into the ketosis, you need a diet 60 to 70 percent fat. I run my body at about 60 percent starches and vegetables, 20 percent protein from plants, and 20 percent fat from nuts, plants, and sea plants. I have to say, my cognitive ability increases with more fat. A lot of um, biohackers and scientists are really pushing the ketogenic diet and not all fat from animals. I would like to get your take on it. Well, as you know, Gustavo, this, this has been in the past an hour long it lecture. <clears throat> uh, I, I started out this presentation by discussing Kevin Hall and showing that the NIH studies on the metabolic advantage of these low carb diets, they proved to be wrong. <clears throat> the low carbers won't, will not accept the NIH findings, even though they paid Gary Taubes for the study. They won't accept the results. Uh, as the as the um, questioner, the doctor of chiropractic asked, uh, is it good to be in ketosis? The answer is no. Uh, this is a survival situation. This occurs when you're starving to death. You go into ketosis, so it's not so painful. We talked about this last week. This occurs when you're very sick with, say, you know, a gastrointestinal flu or something. Uh, you're supposed to be recovering, not gathering and preparing food. These are natural. These are. This is a state that occurs naturally during sickness and during starvation. <clears throat> it's not a state, uh, it's not a blissful state as Dr. Robert Atkins used to describe it, and so does uh, William Davis. Excuse me, I got Dr. Davis's wrong name wrong last time. It's William Davis of uh, the Wheat Belly. So I, as they describe, and David Perlmutter, as they describe the blissful, they do, I've, I've got recordings of them, the blissful state of ketosis. This is not a blissful state. This is a survival state. And you stink of ketones. I mean, smell your breath, you stink. Your body stinks. You know, you're, you're in a situation setting yourself up to die of heart disease by eating all these animal foods. You're losing large amounts of calcium in your urine. Now, this was shown by Atkins' own studies. You, uh, you know, you increase your risk of osteoporosis. And Atkins' own studies that was done by a guy named Westman many years ago, about 70% of the people were constipated. And I think it was 60% complained of halitosis. Excuse me, the blissful state of ketosis? Uh, uh, you're, you know, anybody who's, who says that, and I don't mean the doctor of chiropractic that just called, but his or her friends that are out there promoting this dishonesty, stop it, will you? You know, stop it. The NIH says you're wrong. In fact, Kevin Hall will bring a big, big slide, I hope he shows it, with a picture of our now elect president and his face, which you can all picture. No criticism intended, but his, you know, the special smile right there with a big statement across it. When referring to Taubes and Mark Hyman, wrong. These people are wrong. But you know what? <clears throat> They've got the meat, dairy, and egg industry. Very happy about what they have to say. You know, a lot of people love to hear good news about their bad habits. You learn to That's live right. on a diet of bacon and brie, so right. you know it's it's easy to buy. But you know, there's so much at stake because they're wrong. Exactly, exactly. And Dr. McDougall, places like, for example, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. <laughs> Uh, that don't support the, you know, whole food, plant-based diet. Do, would you think that is mostly because of uh, ties to the industry or why not? Well, 
I think that's a big share of it. The other problem is, is that people can't see past their own dinner plates. So I haven't been to an American Heart Association meeting in decades, but when I used to go, and I'm, I, I'd be surprised if it's different now. Yeah. When yeah. I used to go, they would serve, uh, they would serve, uh, you know, pork chops and steaks and cheesecake. So here you have these uh, very world famous cardiologists standing up there at the lectern, and uh, in one hand they have a paper that says. Uh, eating these animal foods and related elevation of cholesterol will kill you from, you will die of heart disease. So these very famous professors are standing up there with this paper and at the lectern, they have a plate of bacon and eggs and they're shoveling bacon and eggs in their mouth and they're going, I'm confused. I'm, co I'm just totally confused <laughs> about what this is saying. <laughs> well, a lot of the problem is, is that your, your researchers, I mean, just take a look at them. They're just like the rest of the public. 80% are overweight. 38% are obese. They're constipated. They're sick, not because they intend to be or they're not intelligent or educated people. It's just they bought into a lie, uh, the American diet, or further worse than that, they bought into low-carb diets. And so that's another reason that you hear this uh, right. great difference in information. It benefits industry. People love to hear good news about their bad habits, and your researchers are confused. Bacon eggs? Yes, that's you, right. You know, I don't get it. Something's, wrong. Like There's something's wrong. There's a disconnect. So yeah, I think that uh, what you just said, I think you need to trademark that phrase. Stop it. Just, you know, <laughs> because all these people were, you know, get so confused reading. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they, do, well, they, they do, Gustavo, but this has been going on forever. Uh, a forever. lady who was quite famous had her own television show. Her name was Susan Powder. I think it was P-O-W-T-E-R. And my guess is she's still alive. She used to be a, a great follower of mine. She had her own television show. And we did a few things together. I forget what we've done together, but a few things. But her famous saying was, stop the insanity. That's right. And yes. It was 30 years ago. Stop. You remember that? I do. Stop I remember insanity. that. And the insanity is as uh, bad today, if not worse, than it was before, I, at least in terms of percent of people in the world who are misinformed. Maybe the absolute number of us who understand the importance of, quote, vegetarian, vegan, plant food-based, starch-based diet, not eating animals. I mean, there, there may be an absolute mo number more of us. I'm sure there are worldwide. But just think, the, the number of people has gone from three or four billion since I was young to seven billion. <clears throat> and the number of people eating a rich diet has gone from, well, I, just did a, I just did an introduction for a, a translation of starch solution into Italian. It'll be out in Italian in a few weeks. So I just did a, they asked me to do a special introduction for the Italian edition. And uh, what I noticed is I started out by saying that when in 1970, I first visited Italy, 1970, I was in probably just starting medical school. And I said, I was upset because of the, because they cheated me in Italy, because when I ordered a pizza, I, I couldn't detect the cheese on it. There was so little cheese. There was a big crust and some tomato sauce, but no cheese. And I was used to, you know, quarter inch or half an inch thick of cheese and sausage on my pizza. And so that was 1970. Well, in researching this chapter for the Italian book, I noted that the uh, that the cheese intake went from one, one pound to seven pounds, one pound to seven pounds, and the meat intake doubled, and the olive oil intake has increased also since 1970. <clears throat> well, anyway, um, you know, so the number of people eating the rich Western diet has increased by, let's just guess, five to tenfold in China and Italy and. Italy has the second highest rate of obesity in children in the world, just behind Greece. You know, so the number of people absolute in the world, as well as the number of people who buy into this uh, uh, meat and cheese and fish and dairy based diet has increased drastically. Right, right. Yeah, it has. Uh, Dr. McDougall, did you just mention a few minutes ago a paper written by Kevin Hall? Yeah. Uh, what what do you know? The, do you remember, can you repeat the the title, or do you know it? Well, you can just look up hey, Kevin Hall. Okay. You can look at look up low carb diets. 
Right. Uh, okay. Cell metabolism was the journal, but I sent it to you last week. Last week, that's right. Last well, week someone is asking week. here, and so mm -hmm. maybe she doesn't get, or, or he doesn't get, the, get email. the email. Yes, okay, so it's from, it's from okay. last week. Yeah, it was from a, from an ad for the advanced study weekend we sent last week, and it not, it only has the, uh, the two papers, one from The Biggest Loser, the other from uh, right. the lack of metabolic advantage of low-carb diets, which is exactly. the one that the low-carbers are all upset about. Both of them are free open access uh, uh, there are links in the uh, in the mailing I sent you. Right. these right. these links I sent these emails I send you are just not just throwing your trash ban Ben right uh, these emails are important they have all they kinds of really important scientific information they uh, do oh I love those links because you yeah. can instantly go to the source they're great right. Dr. McDougall yeah. would you comment on something here um, about uh, maybe triglycerides be, be the the cost being insufficient protein. Is that ever possible? Uh, triglycerides being insufficient protein. Well, if you go on a low carb, high meat diet, you'll lose weight and triglycerides will go down. So your cholesterol, so your blood sugar. I mean, you know, there are lots of ways to make your cholesterol and triglycerides and blood pressure and blood sugar go, go down. We've talked about this many times before. One way is to make yourself sick with these low-carb diets, which is what they do. So eating meat would do that. You know, Any way you can lose weight. I've, I've jokingly told you this. I'm, I'm going to put it someday in a talk or a newsletter. Uh, you can cure high triglycerides. You can lower cholesterol. You can lower blood pressure. Uh, you can lower blood sugar by any form of weight loss. And I've told you, you can do this by making yourself sick with these low carb diets. You can wire your teeth together. Dentists can do that. Uh, you can do go through bariatric surgery where they rearrange your stomach with uh, by putting a band or a sleeve or a bypass in. So due to this metabolic uh, misarrangement of your, of your gut, they can make you sick enough so you lose weight and your triglycerides will come down. Uh, they could do brain surgery on you and make you lose your appetite and your appetite, your all these biomarkers will go down. You can get cancer chemotherapy. My patients who get chemotherapy for breast and colon and prostate cancer, they uh, the result is their blood sugar goes down and blood pressure goes down and their body weight goes down because they're so sick, sick. And then the last uh, kind of joke I told you is to treat type two diabetes and high triglycerides is to cut off people's lower extremities and then they can't go to the refrigerator and it will go down too, but that's not the answer you wanted. Uh, <clears throat> triglycerides are fats in the blood. They go up when you eat a lot of food, a lot of fat, a lot of sugar, a lot of fruit. Uh, they just go up in, in our program, triglycerides go up, I think three points when we studied 1,615 people. But in people who had triglycerides, say five, six, seven hundred, they often went down three, four hundred points. So uh, I, I wouldn't worry a lot about the triglycerides, particularly if they're below three, four, five hundred. I see people that have triglycerides of a thousand. I've seen them at five thousand. Uh, wow. So I, it, it's it, it kind of it, it, it's a marker that may have been some interest to you. You never want to treat them with drugs. Because mm -mm. the, the 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 fibrates uh, which are used to treat uh, high triglycerides and still used are very dangerous drugs and very ineffective at uh, preventing heart disease. They may prevent pancreatitis, which is a result of high triglycerides, but they're commonly prescribed to uh, prevent heart disease from high triglycerides. Should not be used. All right, all right. Fish, Thank fish you. Oil. Fish oil, fish oil also lowers triglycerides. Oh. Don't do it. Don't do it. The fish, the fish are unhappy enough. They're, you know, <laughs> They're being extinct already. Uh, They're almost gone. I, you know, we'll uh, probably see some fish next week. What? We're going to see some fish next week. Oh, yes. We, but we'll see them and we won't eat them. <laughs> no, we're not going to eat them. We'll have, <clears throat> as far as, unless, as, unless any of our 150 people, uh, defect uh, from the program. <laughs> I unless, doubt it with the kind of food that you all prepare. And, unless they um, unless they go to the other dining rooms, there'll be no fish. <laughs>
Um, one more question, Dr. Madugal, and then we'll probably quit for today. Um, someone says, I know that conventional advice is to limit salt intake to lower blood pressure and reduce risk of heart disease. But I wonder if salt is not just scapegoat for the animal foods that are actually causing the hypertension and heart disease. What's your take on salt as part of the starch diet? Is it less of a concern when animal foods are out of the picture? Uh, dramatically so. In fact, I wrote a newsletter called uh, "Salt: The Scapegoat of the American Diet," <laughs> and uh, yes, it's 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 the um, <clears throat> it's the bacon, the salt and the bacon that's killing you. It's the pig. It's not the salt and the cheese that's killing you. It's the cheese. Uh, it's just the only way they can get you to eat the bacon and the cheese is to load it with salt. Uh, you will find it from that newsletter or in the Starch Solution book. That when you reduce sodium intake uh, by about 1,700 milligrams, which is uh, over a half a teaspoon of salt, down to 2,300 milligrams, the reduction in blood pressure is just real tiny. It's about three or four millimeters of mercury on top and about a half a millimeter on the bottom. So hardly any reduction from that level of uh, decrease in intake and salt intake. If you get really, really... Uh, really, really far in your reduction, which is uh, with a diet that I have great respect for and I use sometimes called the Kempner diet, which is my December 2013 newsletter. Then you'll find when you cut your intake, and Walter Kempner used to wash the white rice to get the sodium off of it. When you uh, <clears throat> go to that extreme of sodium reduction, you can get a profound drop in blood pressure. So uh, we use salt on the surface of our food uh, there will be the food cooked in Kauai this week is going to be relatively low sodium, but there will be salt shakers and soy sauce bottles on the table because salt gets you to eat the food. Salt is, <clears throat> as this, uh, uh, this caller correctly identified, salt is a marker for bad food. And whether or not it causes any serious impairment, it might. When you get to levels of, uh, say, 11 grams a day as opposed to three grams that Americans eat or one gram that I eat, it might. Let's just say it does. But your focus of attention should not be on getting salt out of the diet. Because one way to ruin a, a, a new diet for somebody is to make it low sodium. I don't care whether you make it low sodium chicken or a low sodium pig or low sodium potatoes. So, uh, one of the ways that makes it hard for people to enjoy the food is the salt's gone. And that's why we always put salt on the table to, so you can add it to the food, like the minestrone soup or uh, you don't have, well, anyway, you, you get the point. Salt tastes. True. It's true. I am. I have to testify to that because I wanted to try it and so, um, I can live without adding sugar <laughs> or oil, but um, yeah. I do put a little bit of salt on, like you said, on the surface of the food. And not yeah. all the time, but sometimes, but um, it's very hard yeah. to eat a complete <laughs> salt free. Not impossible. I know Chef AJ eats <laughs> salt free. <Yeah. laughs> but, well, you can, you can, so does Jeff Novick. Right. Uh, Jeff, our dietitian, eats salt free. And you can make right. that adjustment. My diet is. When people sit with me at, uh, at the clinic uh, for my meals, I, I'm sure they notice always what I eat. And one of the things that they do notice, I don't add salt to my food because my palate has adjusted so much that one right. of the things that offends me most when I go out, say I go to a taqueria and get whole beans, whole, whole pinto beans, you know, I'll look at Mary and I'll say, you know, I really can't eat these. They're so salty. So... She says, no, no they're, no, they're really not. You know, and it tastes good to her palate. But for me, because I've adjusted so much, even, even what people would consider low sodium or, or normal sodium, uh, I'm sure AJ and Jeff Novix feel the same way. It's too much because of the adaptation I, we've gone through. But uh, if you go from the American diet, that is uh, the only way they can get you to eat is to load it with salt. Right, right. Our kind of diet, and and you leave the salt out, boy, it's it's going to be a tough road for you. Well, and isn't isn't it true, Doctor McDougall, that even if you don't add salt, I mean, all the foods that we eat already have left some level of sodium, right? They, they do have. Uh, they do have uh, sodium, 
salary is particularly noted as high right. sodium, but right. it's hardly any sodium, so don't expect to get. <laughs> well, there's a, or you, you cannot design a sodium deficient diet. What would be sodium deficiency? Well, I, I, I've read that research many years ago, and it's 50, 50, 50 milligrams or less. Uh, Kepner tried to get you less than 500 milligrams. Our diet is about 1,000 milligrams. And my estimate is that people who add a half a teaspoon of salt to the surface of the food, they've added another 1,000 milligrams. So now they're at 2,000 milligrams. The uh, recommendation from the Heart Association is 3,000. Well, let's see. They've come out with a few, but 3,600. I think some of people now recommend the 1,500. But they're in the 1,500, 3,500 range. And our diet's 1,000, and you add a half a teaspoon of salt, it's still less than the 3,600 milligrams commonly recommended for a low-sodium diet. Americans eat maybe three, four, five, six grams. Koreans, 11 grams. Japanese, post-World War II, you know, 10, 11, 12 grams of sodium. Uh, that gives you some relative idea of, uh, of what you can right. use. Right. Okay. All right. Well, great. Can you just say one more thing about, there was a person asking, how do you become a McDougal star? <laughs> what what well, are you? Uh, what, what, what do people do is they write me <laughs> all, every day, Mary and I and Heather and Neil and you, Gustavo, and Jeff Novick, we get these amazing stories from people. Oh, I had horrible rheumatoid arthritis, and now here I am a month later, I take no drugs, and I'm completely free of my arthritis. Or I've had ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. I turn on TV and I watch these ads. If you have Crohn's disease, and they show this beautiful young woman whose uh, life is obviously happy now because she was put on one of these biologic drugs, which she could never afford. They're 35000 to 75000 a year to take. And life is wonderful. And she's cheery and happy with her kids. And you know, I sit and sigh and realize what's going on. These are drugs that severely suppress the immune system and increase the risk of cancer and infection. And uh, she or he thinks that they made this huge set, step. In fact, they even call it remission. <clears throat> when uh, this is simply a disease of the Western diet and people are cured, now, you should expect dramatic results if you have inflammatory bowel disease with the diet that I recommend. It takes a while, it takes less than four months, but it takes a while. Well, anyways, in answer to your question, uh, Gustavo, is people write us these letters and we go, and we never get tired of hearing this. People say to me, oh, I bet you're tired of hearing this. I said, no, no, I'm never tired. I said, tell me again, I'm never tired of hearing this. And none of us are. So we get these amazing letters and I'll write them back and I'll say, well, would you like to tell your story to help other people? And about half of people say, no, I'm too private. And the other people say, yeah, you know, I'm so grateful that if there's anything I can do to help somebody else, like write you a story and send you a couple of pictures and tell you about my children and grandchildren, how my husband's life has changed since I'm not sick anymore. Uh, we say, yeah, write, write us a story. And then we put them up. We probably put uh, two or three a month up. But these are uh, pretty much unsolicited stories right, of people right. who, who write to us and want to want to tell us about what happened. And if you'd like to share, and there's also on our discussion board, there's a testimony page. So if you don't want to go to all the trouble of becoming a star McDougaler, which means that we, we write up your story, we do, we put your pictures in and we send it out to everybody, you know, all 70,000 people on our emailing list. If you don't want to do all that, you can always just go to the discussion board, put a testimony in there. There are amazing testimonies on the discussion board. Take you just a few right, minutes. Right. And I know that when we go to either your three day weekend or the any of the live events in Santa Rosa, yeah. your your uh, camera, your tech uh, guy there is Rob, always Rob ready to take the yeah. Uh, Rob, is Rob or Keith? No, it's Rob. Rob's Rob's there, yeah. and Rob will be yeah. filming uh, this weekend coming up. And so, any of you who have a story you'd like to tell uh, during the advanced study weekend, Rob will take you aside and have you talk for five, 10, 15 minutes, and these will go up. And you know, writing something is important. But a lot of us aren't readers, and and it doesn't feel the same in the written word as somebody looking at you right in the eye in a video and saying, you know, I I used to take four different kinds of diabetic pills and three different kinds of blood pressure pills, and 
you know, whenever I flew, I had to order an, a seatbelt extender. And I couldn't play with my grandkids. And, you know, for somebody to say, and this is what I used to look like. Not only was I morbidly obese, but I was old and sick looking. And then have them put up a, either a picture, which we sometimes do, but they're sitting there live in front of Rob. And uh, they, they just look so young and so attractive. Yes, yes. And uh, So, yeah, we do those too. All right. And this weekend, we're going to find out if you have that tattoo. Yes, that, that, that's right. Not, not <laughs> if, but what the tattoo looks like. You are going to see, I am going to take off my shirt next week, and I'm going to show you my tattoo. Oh, says, right. <laughs> do not calf. I will sue. In fact, I was I, thinking of selling, of selling T-shirts. <laughs> that's because, right. I think we you know, you, you, <laughs> say, say, you know, say you have something happen to you and you, you're afraid to go to the hospital because you know they're going to cath you. Remember, half the, Put on who, shirt. Yeah, half the people who go for non cardiac surgery who have obstructive coronary artery disease, which is most of the population, half the people are advised to get prophylactic revascularization, which means they have, they have to have their heart arteries operated on before they can have their hip fixed or the colon cancer operated on. And so they send you to the cath room where they do all kinds of damage and no good. And uh, to help save yourself, you could get a tattoo like I have, which says, do not cath, I will sue. Or when they sell you a t-shirt, an easy to put on t-shirt, which you can grab, the ambulance is taking you out the door. Do not cath, I will sue. All right. Yes. I think I would order about 12 of them so I can wear them all the time. <laughs> yeah. One, one by your door, one in your car. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I am going to take off my shirt probably on Tuesday and show you my tattoo. All right. Wow. We're looking forward to that. Yeah, really, me too. It's, it's been a long yeah. time. Coming. It was May, May 2016, so it'll be almost a year since I took my clothes off and showed you a picture of my tattoo. If you want That's to see right. it, it's in my May 2016 newsletter. You can see my, my bare naked self with a uh, <laughs> with my tattoo. And I've told Mary, and she knows it's true, that if I could get people to listen to me, like uh, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, <clears throat> or even Dr. Oz, or whatever, somebody who could make a difference in your children's lives, you know, save you another happy day with your husband or wife or mother and father, if I could get people to listen to me, I've told Mary many times, I'd stick a carrot in this ear and a stock of celery up my nose and I'd take my clothes off and I'd go bare naked with a watermelon between my legs down the hall. If you get people to listen to you, I would do anything. But I can't get them to listen to you. They, they got all the money. Uh, it's yeah. been my life's work, though, Gustavo. You know, I, I'm a doctor and, and I've seen... And I can't Imagine how frustrating it must be, Dr. McDougall, to see uh, sometimes this nonsense that comes out in the public eye with all these lies. And, and you know, the, the sad thing is, Gustavo, because I work with many young doctors who know the truth. They know the truth about the drugs, like the diabetic drugs that I was just telling you, about uh, the heart surgeries. They know the truth about food. And the dilemma that these young doctors are in is the institutions that hire them want them to churn out as many dollars as they can, as fast as they can. And the model that's designed is a seven minute office visit, which is closed by writing a prescription to you. You know, how are you, Mrs. McGillicuddy? Nice to see you, I see what your chart says. Here's your refill of drugs or here's another one. Boom, goodbye. That's, that's, that's how the business is set up. Otherwise, what are you gonna do? I mean, how are you gonna finish the conversation with your patient? Are you supposed to sit and tell them, well, you know, you're sick and dying. And I told you 6,000 times that you need to change your diet, which the doctor knows nothing about. The doctor knows nothing about diet. All they know about is drugs, pushing drugs. So how do you get the patient out of the office? You know, time's over, ma'am. Time's over, sir. Here's your prescription out of here. Next. You know, that, that, but anyways, it's very frustrating for young doctors and dietitians and those of you yes without credentials who are well informed to sit around and see what's mm -hmm. going on and the fact that it's not changed and the money flow has not changed and will it change so next week you and i will be broadcasting live from Kauai, and uh if you're, if you're willing to, join us. 
if you're willing to, we'll do it from Hawaii. Uh, we'll just yeah, sit, sit yeah. down on the beach and we'll make them all feel bad. Okay. <laughs> well, what thank we should you. Do is we should sit in the dining room and make them feel worse. Oh, eating all that wonderful food? Yeah, yeah. We can't simple. torture our friends that much. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Well, right, thank, thank you. Again, Dr. McDougall, for being here today, uh, giving us your valuable time. And, My uh, pleasure. I'll, I'll I look on, forward. I'll be, on the, I'll be on the airplane with the grandkids tomorrow, and the newsletter will get out Good. as soon as as soon as we can. And Mary's coming in here to tell me one more thing. Probably, probably not. <laughs> okay. Well, she's, tell her she's, hello. She's, she's, she's busy packing, and Mary's a terrible worrier when it comes to flying and getting on an airplane. So. It's going oh, to be yeah. a tough. It's going to be a tough day for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, lots of details to take care of. I have to go pack. So, all right. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody, Goodbye. and we'll see you next week. <laughs> we'll talk to you from Hawaii next week. Bye bye. All right.